Thank you. Well, good evening. I'm Bob, B O B B O B forwards, backwards, can't screw it up. Very simple name. And uh, I'm excited to be here because I love any of the first four lectures of perspectives. Uh, I took perspectives 30 years ago uh, when it was first offered outside of the U.S. Center for World Mission in a place called out of Pasadena, California. I took it at Penn State University. And uh, when I took it there, it totally changed my life. I actually ended up being on a uh, few months after the course on the Libyan Arab Airlines 727, going into the closed country of Libya, where there were zero churches, zero believers, and zero missionaries. An entire political country had to hell with no one trying to stop them, and uh, that began a whole new career change, so to say, in my life, and it's, uh, it's been wonderful since that point in time. Uh, let me, uh, you see on the table there's a prayer card, grab that prayer card, just pass it around a little bit, let me tell you a little bit about my family, I'm married to a beautiful Southern Belle, her name is Debbie, we've been married for 25 years, or 28 years, sorry, honey. and uh, we've got four kids, uh, Luke, and on the very far left are two, Luke and Hannah. Luke is 25 years old. He's our oldest. He's married to Hannah. Uh, the big news is, last week I became a grandfather. And so I have a little granddaughter. My wife is there right now in Phoenix with the baby. And uh, she's precious. Luke and Hannah are on the staff of the group called Frontiers that does church planning in the Muslim world. And uh, so they've been, they'll be going over uh, working among Muslims. Next is my daughter Elise in the pink. Uh, she is uh, 24 years of age. She is in Israel right now teaching Palestinian kids. She's a third grade teacher among Palestinian kids. Loves it. The kids love her. She's having a great time there impacting them. 95% of her students are Muslims, even though it's taught from a Christian perspective. So she's having a great time there. Next is my daughter Abigail. Abigail is kind of in the red there, the sh uh, shorts, uh, the top, whatever. I can't remember the picture. <laughs> but anyhow, she's the only other girl there. And uh, she is uh, currently living next door to Luke and Hannah. She wants to be a, a good aunt, so she graduated from college and just went out there a waitress so she could be by her niece. So she's out there. And lastly is the big boy Hunter. Hunter is 19 years of age. He's a sophomore at James Madison University. Wants to be a pastor and uh, be used that way by God. He has been on many a mission trip. He said, Dad, I'm not called to be a missionary. <laughs> I want to send the labor. I said, fine, that's great. Uh, so it's a little bit about our family. We do live in Richmond, Virginia. We've been there for about 15 years. And um, I have, uh, I went overseas to North Africa, to Libya, worked among Muslims there, have come back and basically been mobilizing people for the past 30 years. Uh, my job is that of a mobilizer. I do that full time, travel, speak. Uh, my job is to step on your toes. If you walk away saying, wow, I really enjoyed that message, I didn't do my job. Uh, so we'll see what happens tonight, see what God does. Um, I want to start off, you've got a set of notes, you should have a set of notes, and uh, you know what, I don't have a set of notes. Can you get me, is there an extra set somewhere, uh, so I can know, thank you so much. Uh, I want to start off, every speaker is different, every speaker has their own uh, bent, whatever, uh, on how they communicate things, so I want to try to start off and lay a real quick foundation uh, to kind of give you a perspective, learn some terminology, and we'll kind of go from there. Uh, to help you understand uh, something that I call the other side of the cross. The other side of the cross. I was speaking at a church in California many years ago. And as I was speaking at that church, uh, they asked me to speak at a Sunday school class. I had totally forgotten about it. But I walked in, uh, in between the two main services where I was speaking, walked into the Sunday school class, and just said the one second prayer, the Lord help, what do you want me to say? And so I walked in, there were anywhere from 7 to 70 years of age. Had a very mixed crowd. And so I just, uh, I started asking some very basic questions. I said, let me just ask you some questions. Said, what do you think is the primary purpose of the church? And I was in a Sunday school class, and, and there was a whiteboard there, so they began to list things. So I began to write them up on the, on the whiteboard. Uh, they said, you know, to glorify God, to, be, to uh, reach the lost, to save the world, to do all these things. I said, okay, good. I said, let me ask you a second question. What's the primary purpose for Christ's death? And they said, well, to die for our sins, to be an example, to do this, to do that. I said, okay. I said, now, I asked you for primary. I said, that means only one of those could be the primary. So I said, I, I want you to vote. So they all had two votes. They had to vote for the one on the left, the one on the right. 
So they voted for the one on the left, which is the primary purpose of the church, and they concluded that the primary purpose of the church was to glorify God. You can write that there in your notes right there. Primary purpose of the church is to glorify God. I said, okay, good. A lot of scripture that points to that, backs that up. I said, now let me ask you another thing. Let's vote on the right. So they all voted on the right, and they said the primary purpose of Christ's death was to die for our sins. You can write that one in there, die for our sins. I said, okay. I said, now experts in the field of communication tell us that 90% of what gets communicated to us gets communicated to us non-verbally. So I said, let me ask you a question. What does the one on the left non-verbally communicate life is all about? Well, they kind of looked at it and they said, well, life is all about God. I said, yeah. I said, good. I said, what does the one on the right non-verbally communicate life is all about? And they said, life is all about us. I said, welcome to the conflicting, confusing communication found in the church today. Not in media, <laughs> in the church. Conflicting, confusing communication found in the church. Half the time we hear sermons that it's all about God. Half the time we hear sermons it's all about us. Half the time we hear uh, hymns that say it's all about God half the time we hear hymns or songs that say it's all about us and the average Christian is quite honestly left there scratching their head saying well, well which is it is life about God or is life about us and they get some conflicting confusing communication going on I want to try to, to clarify real quickly and try to bring this all together for you in this very brief opening I, I do whole lecture two I spent an hour on this two hours on it but we're going to just go over it quickly with it if, if uh, in John chapter 12, verses 27 and 28, uh, Jesus is in the festival at Jerusalem. He's, at the, he's, in the, he's just a day away from being crucified. And as he's about to be crucified, he knows the pain and the agony he's going to be going through. And he opens up his heart for the very first time to his disciples about his impending death. And he says these words. He says, now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father... Save me from this hour? No, it is for this very reason I came to this hour. So he's basically saying, look guys, I want to do this. This is going to hurt. And then he says one word. Father. Father. So he's done talking to his disciples. He's about to address his heavenly father. Got the context? Okay. He's about to die the worst agonizing death any human can endure. Uh, not nailed because one nail went on one nail on the other hand, one nail between the two feet, but rather hanging there on the cross, your muscles begin to get paralyzed, and you slowly suffocate to death. It's the worst death any human can endure, or one of the worst deaths any human can endure. And uh, as a result of that, he's going to talk to his heavenly father about why he's dying. Now, here's a key question. It's not rhetorical. You've got to give me an answer. Do you think he's going to talk to his heavenly father about the primary reason of why he's going to the cross or a secondary reason of why he's going to the cross? What do you think? Primary or secondary? I think primary too. Notice what he does not say. He does not say, Father, save these kind, wonderful, worthy people from hell. They don't deserve it. In fact, he doesn't even Talk about us. Oh, really? I thought it was all about us. No. What does he say? Open your Bibles. John chapter 12, 27 and 28. Turn your cell phones on. Just do whatever. Find out what it says. Actually, it's right there in your notes. How about that? What does he say? It's right there in your notes. Father, glorify your name. Glorify your name. I want to challenge you. The true driving passion to put Christ on the cross was to bring His Father glory. I bring out seven reasons in my book, A Cat and Dog Look at the Cross. I'm not going to go over them because that's what I do in much or two. But in this one, I just, I'm just going to summarize it. Jesus died primarily to bring His Father glory. Now, if that is the case, which I want to challenge you that it is, then if the church's primary purpose is to glorify God and Christ's death was primarily to glorify God, what do we have now? 
We have a consistent message in the church. Life is about glorifying God. I need to glorify God in how I treat my spouse. I need to glorify God in how I treat my grandchildren. I need to glorify God in how I do my job at work. I need to glorify God in how I date. I need to glorify God in how I drive and how I dress. I need to glorify God in every area of life. All of a sudden, life is about glorifying God. And we get a consistent message no matter where we go throughout the Bible. We realize this is all about God being glorified. Now, if that's the case, how does that deal with world evangelization? Because perspectives, uh, depending upon how your teacher number two did or number three, basically perspectives has communicated that it's all about reaching the world, right? This Bible is a missions book. The living God is a missionary God. So it's all about world evangelization. So how do the two tie together? Well, I want to try to tie them together for you tonight in a very simple concept. And I'm going to do that by asking you a simple question. How many of you have worshipped God with people from other cultures in their culture? Okay, a lot of you. What did it do to your vision of God? Blew it out. Blew it out, sure. There's a very simple principle found in there, and that principle is this. God reveals more of His glory when we worship Him with people that are diverse. That should be right there in your notes. God reveals more of His glory by unifying that which is diverse. Take two diverse people, bring them together in the blood of Jesus Christ, heal them, whether there's a couple on the verge of divorce, you heal their marriage, they stand in awe of God, and everybody immediately involved in their lives stands in awe of God. But push it even further. Take a Hezbollah soldier, an Israeli soldier, lead them to Christ. They set aside their, their guns and they come together in harmony. They were trying to kill each other now are worshiping God together in harmony. Everyone stands in awe of God because of the differences that were overcome. Put them with the unified couple and God reveals even more of His glory. Take a Hindu from the highest caste and a Hindu from the lowest caste, the elite caste, and lead them to Christ, bring them together. They come together and touch for the very first time the untouchable with the highest caste, and they worship God in harmony. All of India stands in awe. Put them together with the reconciled soldiers, the reconciled soldiers. God reveals even more glory. You're finding a principle. When more diversity is united, more of God's glory is revealed. So what do you think is going to happen when you and I are there with people from every tongue, every tribe, and every nation? God will not only reveal glory as if he greets the Jews only. He'll not only reveal greater glory as if he greets the Jews and a few Gentile groups. When you and I are there with people from every tongue, every tribe, and every nation, then and only then will our Father reveal his greatest glory. His greatest glory. I want to challenge you that is the true driving motivation that we should have is to reveal our Father's greatest glory. Now, if you go to the mission field without that as a driving perspective, and your primary motivation is to reach the lost because they're going to hell, that's not an incorrect motivation, but I want to challenge you, it should not be your primary motivation. Why? Well, having been on staff with Frontiers for over 20 years, plus years, I can tell you many examples of individuals who were so focused on reaching their Muslims, coffee with them, going out with them, talking with them, socializing with them, they neglected their marriage, they neglected their kids, and after eight years they came home and divorced. Why? For the husband, it was so focused on reaching the lost because they're all going to hell, he forgot it was about the glory of the Father. And as a result, he neglected his marriage, neglected his kids, his wife threw her hands up and said, I can't take this anymore. It was reported one child has said, I wish I'd been born a Muslim, my father would have spent more time with me. But if your focus is on the glory of God, you begin to balance the glory of God in all areas of your life. And you stay healthy that way. Now this challenge, this theme of creating diversity, bringing back together harmony, I want to challenge you, is the theme of God's Word. 
We're going to follow it, and tonight we're going to look at it in the New Testament in very much detail. But it starts, the beginning of this whole concept starts in the very first commandment to all of mankind. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 is the very first that thing said to all of humanity. Basically, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Fill the earth and subdue it. I want to ask you a question. Fill the earth. Scatter across the face of the earth. What happens to a language over centuries of time when you fill the earth? Changes. That's right. Starts off with accents. New words start to form. And over centuries, entire new languages are birthed. Latin is a dead language. But before Latin died, it birthed six different languages. Languages born, they die, but they propagate new languages. I want to challenge you, the very first command to all of mankind, when God said, fill the earth, the intent of that was that God wanted to create diversity so we could bring it back together in harmony to reveal His, no, not His glory, His, Greatest glory. If he wanted glory, he would just have one people group. That's all he needed. But to reveal his greatest glory, he wanted to create diversity. You all know the story. Mankind sins, every one of them. God brings about a judgment. Noah and his family. Noah gets in the ark for 40 days and 40 nights with the kids. A year later, they crash. And after crashing, God gives them a rainbow. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, we read these words. Then God blessed Noah and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and... Fill the earth. What's he doing? He's on the same game plan. I want you to create diversity so I can bring it back together in harmony to reveal my greatest glory. We've got to figure out that's part of the theme of tonight. I'll say it over and over again. So, Genesis chapter 11, though, we found out that there's a problem. Anybody know what the problem was in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1? Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. Which means at this point in the history of mankind, there was no us then mentality. There was only us. One people, one nation, one language, one culture. If you're tracking with me, and very slowly and clearly on this one, at this point in time, God had the potential for revealing His glory, but not His greatest glory. Because there's only one group of people. And note what they said in verse 4. Let us not be scattered. We're not going to allow that to happen. We want to stay unified. Well, God did in one moment what should have taken centuries to do. He takes their entire language and he breaks it up into many different languages. Approximately 70 if you count them up in Genesis chapter 10. Now you say, wait a second. Genesis chapter 10 precludes Genesis chapter 11. How can you say that? Well, when Hebrew writers wrote about something very significant, they wrote about it twice. Creation is Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Tower of Babel, very significant. Genesis 10, Genesis 11. Seventy, seventy nations created the Tower of Babel. Immediately in God's Word. Immediately in God's Word. Genesis chapter 12, the next chapter. God makes a promise to Abram. And he says two basic things. A, but I want to... Bless you, and I want you to turn around and be a blessing to all the nations on the face of the earth. Tonight I'll be calling that the top line of the covenant and the bottom line of the covenant. Top line of the covenant is the fact that God wants to bless us. Top line blessings. You all know how he wants to bless us. Time, gifts, jobs, talents, energies, family, friends, careers, cars, homes. Most of all, himself. That's the greatest lesson we've ever had is having God himself. Then he turns around and he wants us to be a blessing, bottom line responsibilities, to reach all nations. We've been blessed by God to be a blessing to all nations. And so you said that in your first week uh, going on. And this top line, bottom line run rampant throughout the text. Take, for example, the promised land. The promised land is a land flowing with what? Refers to what part of the covenant? Top line of the covenant or bottom line of the covenant? Top line. top line of the covenant. With every top line blessing, there is a bottom line what? 
responsibility. What's the bottom line responsibility of the promised land? I had no idea. So someone showed me in the back of the Bible a set of maps. You know what I found out? A large majority of the major trading routes went right through the promised land. And if anybody was in, wanted to trade with the powerhouse Egypt down in the south, odds are they were going through the promised land. God had strategically located them so that Ezekiel 5.5 5 says, this is what the sovereign Lord says, this is Jerusalem which I have placed in the center of the nations. The center of the nations. God, the promised land, was yes, the land flowing with milk and honey, top line lessons. Bottom line responsibilities, they were strategically located that all the nations came through trading. They were to share with them about their God. Top line blessings, bottom line responsibilities. Well, you guys know how the story ends up. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. There are people from what? Every tongue, tribe, and nation. So in other words, here in Genesis 12, you've got a promise. Here in Revelation 5, that promise is fulfilled. Here's the promise. Here's the fulfillment. Promise, fulfillment, promise, fulfillment. Everything in between is one story. The story of his glory going out to all nations. God's desire to bless us, that our churches would turn around and bless the nations. And if you haven't graphically seen it before, if you took missions out of the Bible, you'd have very little left to study. Just be 11 chapters. Ah, you can now read through the Bible in a year. <laughs> One chapter a month with December off. Because everything else is missions. Which now you see is the story of His glory. God wanted to create diversity to bring them back together in harmony, to reveal His greatest glory. But the warning, as I try to say to my audiences, I'm still trying to set up our context for tonight's talk, is that it's a lot easier to focus in on one part of the covenant over the other. Which part of the covenant is it the easiest to focus in on? The top line or the bottom line? Okay. Top line of the covenant. I want to see how you guys do. I want to give you a test. It's my bottom line test. I give it all over the world before I go. I say the beginning of a verse, you fill in the rest of the verse. Depending on how you film the rest of the verse will help you determine whether or not you're focused more on the top line or the bottom line. Now before your palms get all sweaty, and, oh man, I hope I know that. Don't worry. If you, if you know what you said, I'll add just be quiet. Maybe everybody here knows it. Maybe no, I don't know. Here it goes. Fill in the rest of this verse. Be still and know that I am God. Come into my presence. Know me. Worship me. Have a relationship with me. Refers to what part of the covenant? Top line or bottom line? Top line of the covenant. That's right. And if you haven't figured it out by now, you all flunked the test. You failed. Why? You just quoted in Psalm 46, verse 10, A, the first third of the verse. Be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. The rest of Psalm 46, verse 10. But maybe you, just like me, when I became a Christian my freshman year at Penn State University, when I got my brand new leather Bible, I got my brand new leather Bible because I was a freshman in college. I read it like I read my yearbook. What's the first thing I did when I got my yearbook? Look for my picture. I went through the whole thing. Where am I? Where am I? And that's how I read my Bible. I opened up my Bible and I asked one very simple question. <coughs> Where am I? What's God got in this for me? How does God want to bless me? What do I get when I'm saved? What do I get when I go to heaven? And without realizing, ah, oh, I should have paid half price for my Bible. Why? I was only reading half of God's Word. I was only reading half of God's Word. I was so focused on the top line of the covenant, I'd highlight Psalm 46, verse 10, A, the first third, you still know that I'm God. I'd go looking for my top next top line verse, having no idea I was passing over. Bottom line, after bottom line, after bottom line. And I had no idea that I was really studying not a theology, I was studying a neology. Where am I in the Bible? What's God got in this for me? As I have talked in various churches all around, I have found out that the majority of Christians that I speak to all know the 
top line lessons and they struggle with the bottom line lessons. That's what I do when I go over lecture number one, but I'm not here to give lecture number one, so we're not going to have a time to do that. But with all that set aside, I want to now start in on tonight's lecture. And as we start in on tonight's lecture, I want you to see this top line, bottom line stuff going through the scriptures and look and see how it deals with Jesus. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, and let's look at the job description of the Messiah. The job description of the Messiah. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, we read these words. It is too small of a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and to bring back those of Israel I have kept. It is too small of a thing for you to be only a Messiah to the Jews. Why is it too small of a thing? Somebody tell me why. He did not reveal His greatest glory. That's right. And Romans 11.36 tells us that everything is from Him, through Him, and to Him. Romans 11.36 is not from us and through us and to us, as most many American Christians believe. It's not everything is from them and through them and to them, as if you're so focused on the lost world. Everything is from Him, through Him, and to Him. So God, who is a jealous God, who says, I'm jealous, I want to lift up my glory. Why? Because when you focus on His glory, you're going to find out you get the most joy. When God, who is a jealous God, sees the Messiah coming, He says, it's too small of a thing for you to be my servant to only the Jews. Because then I'll only reveal my glory. I want to reveal my greatest glory. Therefore, he says, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you might bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Isaiah chapter 49, finishing out verse 6. So Jesus, the Messiah, had a job description. His job description was to be a Messiah not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. And be reaching out to them. Now, before we go on and look at the life of Jesus, I want to summarize and bring this all together in one last way. For those of you who have worked with people from other cultures, I asked you what did it do to your vision of God? You said it increased. Let me ask you another question. What did it do to your joy? Bigger. Same principle. When we worship God with people from other cultures, we get greater joy. So what do you think is going to happen when you and I are there with people from every tongue, every tribe, and every nation? God will not only get the greatest glory, we will get the greatest joy. Men and women, that's what God's working for. Revealing His greatest glory that we might have the greatest joy. What a God who dreamed this up in eternity past. What a God who thought through this. I need to create diversity so I can bring it back together in harmony to reveal my greatest glory. And as a result, my creation will have the greatest joy. This is the God we worship. This is the God we serve. This is the God who's worth living for, suffering for, and dying for. Who's got this plan. So let's see how Jesus did. Let's go to our notes. Matthew chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Talking about the location of Jesus' ministry. Matthew chapter 4, we read these words. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said to the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Now, first off, uh, we need to realize something very key. Jesus did not flip a coin and say, oh, okay, it looks like Nazareth. He was very strategic in going from Nazareth to Capernaum. And the question is, why? Why did Jesus do this? And my amazing whiteboard right here, you all can see it. <laughs> If we were to draw a simple little map, okay, you've got a sea down here, you've got a river, you've got a sea here. What's this called? Galilee. Galilee. This is? Let's see. This is the? Jordan. Jordan. This city right here is? 
Jerusalem, this is? Capernaum. This is Tyre and Sidon up here. Two cities, Tyre and Sidon. And over here is the Decapolis. What does that stand for? Ten cities. Ten cities. It was basically a busing project back in those days to try to integrate the Greeks with the Jews to see if they could learn to get along with each other. So that's what they were trying to do. Now, there are some Jews who will say, look, Mr. Evangelical Christian, I appreciate your sincerity and your zeal for Jesus being the Messiah, but I can guarantee you he was not the Messiah. Oh, why is that? It's very simple. If Jesus was the Messiah, he would have based his ministry in the heart of Judaism, which was where? Jerusalem. But instead he chose some podunk town way north called Capernaum, which obviously communicates he was not the Messiah. Because no Messiah would have chosen to locate up there. Said with a perspective solely focused on the top line of the country. But now realizing that his job description was to be both top line and bottom line to reach both the Jews and the Gentiles, you realize, wow, this trip up here was anywhere from a, I don't know, a three to five day walking trip. That's a long trip. Now to be able to go for three to five days walking, would you have to have enough or a lot of motivation to go check to see if this guy really was the Messiah, yes or no? Yeah, and do the Jews have that kind of motivation, yes or no? Yes. Yeah, they were waiting a thousand years for a Messiah. Would the Gentiles living way up north in places like Tyre and Sidon have enough motivation to travel five days, it was a five-day journey with a sick person, to see a healing man, yes or no? Maybe, but maybe not, because they had nothing in their background that was talking about a Messiah who might come. So what did Jesus do? Jesus chose to locate in a mixed Jewish-Gentile territory so he could minister to both Jews and to Gentiles. Because he was living out his job description of being the Messiah to redeem people from every tongue, every tribe, and every nation to help reveal his Father's greatest glory. Jesus was very strategic in where he chose to locate. Now, does the Bible say we're supposed to be like Jesus or not? Obvious answer, what? Yes. Of course. How do most Christians choose where they're going to live? What do you think, Joe? Yeah, your, job. your job. And how do you choose which job you're going to take? Pays. Yeah, which pays the most? So you choose your job first, and then you choose the nice neighborhood, and what has nice school systems, and then you begin to get situated and located, then you look for a church. Do we really want to be like Jesus? He chose a strategic place to live first, to touch nations. Then, he began to trust God for his needs. Very challenging, isn't it? Most Americans have got it wrong. We need our security first. Where's the job? What pays the most? And then, how can I serve God now that I've got my security? That's not what Jesus did. Very different. If we're to be like him, we need to consider some of these challenges of Jesus who was Messiah to all peoples. Let's go on down to the next verse. Matthew chapter 4, 25 and 26. Jesus heals the Gentiles. Matthew chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. News about him spread all over where? Syria. Syria. What kind of people are in Syria? Jews or Gentiles? Gentiles. Gentiles. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, the epileptics, and the paralytics. And he separated the Jews from the Gentiles, healed the Jews, and sent the Gentiles home. Is that what the text says? No, he what? Healed them, meaning both Jews and Gentiles. Jesus, when he saw ministries for opportunity, he was colorblind. Didn't matter to him who it was. 
I'm going to minister to anybody that my Father brings across my path and minister to them and reach out to them in the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of us go by 7-Elevens, gas stations, whatever, and see internationals in there behind, they're taking our money? How many of you have seen that? Yeah. How many times do we reach out to them? Most of us hardly ever. Why? Well, they're not one of us. And we usually like to reach people that are like us because we feel better about that. And as a result, we can be passing up opportunity after opportunity with what God is doing with people right around the corner from us. Sue Pat, who's your speaker coming up, I think, in one of your lectures, uh, was down speaking at our course down in Richmond, Virginia. And as she was speaking, she talked about this restaurant that she's been going to for years, owned by a man from another nation, I forget what nation it was. And uh, she'd been going there for quite a few years, and then, you know, it finally dawned on her. Hey, I wonder if this guy's ever been into an American home. If you don't know, I've been told you, 80% of all internationals in America have never been into an American home. 80% of all internationals have never been into an American home. Why is that? We're so preoccupied with God, what? Blessing us. We're not worried about being a blessing to others. So she went to this guy and she said, uh, you know, I've been eating here at your place. I kind of know you, you know that, but can I ask you a question? He says, sure, what? She says, how long have you lived here? I believe it was 25 years. She said, I'm trying to remember myself. I think he said 25 years. She says, have you ever been in an American home? He said, no, never been. She said, could I have you over for dinner? He said, I'd love to. Simple thing. We overlook, we're, we just look right through people from other nations that are living right around the corner from us just because we're not trained to look for them. We're not trained to see opportunities for the bottom line to be reaching out to them. And simply having them over for dinner is one of the greatest things that we can do. Uh, my wife and I reach out to Egyptians in the uh, uh, Richmond area. And so we have Egyptians that love coming to our home. Not because our home is anything special, because we just have them over for dinner and love on them. And they they just, my friend Charlie, you gotta go to Bob and Denny's house. You just gotta, you gotta see how nice it is there, how much they love you. Why, we just had them over for dinner. And we've just shared the love of God. We didn't share our faith per se, but we just loved on them. And we honored them as individuals, honored them as Muslims. Hey, have you prayed yet? Uh, no, I haven't. Go into the room. Go pray before dinner. Oh, thanks. And so we tell them to go pray. To do their prayer over the time. Loving them. Reaching out to people. Jesus healed them. Both the Jews and the Gentiles. Constantly ministering to people of all ages. Okay, let's go to Matthew chapter 8, 5 to 13. Matthew chapter 8, 5 to 13. Faith of the centurion. Starting in verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed in terrible suffering. Jesus said, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have to come under my roof, but just say the word, my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority. With soldiers on me, I tell this one, go and he goes, that one, come and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished, and on and on it goes. We're going to stop right there. Okay, starting at verse 5. Uh, he entered Capernaum, a centurion came asking for help. Lord, my servant lies at home. First off, centurion, what kind of a person? Jew or Gentile? What kind of a Gentile? Roman soldier, okay? Were Roman soldiers high on the list of Jews? No. Uh -uh. I'm sorry, which list? Exactly, which list? Go ahead, just turn that off. Which list? Yeah. No, very low on the list because they were occupying him and they wanted to have freedom. Uh, and so he was very low on the totem pole. Uh, and But uh, he says, would you come to my house? Now, Jesus was one of the top rabbis now back at this time. Tremendous high rabbi. And was it okay for rabbis to go into the house of an uncircumcised man? To go to the house of a Gentile? Yes or no? No. What would happen to him? 
He had become unclean and defiled. But what does Jesus say to the centurion? What's the text saying? I will what? I'll go. What was Jesus doing? He was breaking the rules that were man-made of those days. He was breaking the man-made rules that there were back in those days. Man-made rules said, you're not allowed to go to the house of a Gentile. You're not allowed to do this. You can't heal on the Sabbath. You can't do any work on the Sabbath. Jesus was consistently breaking the man-made rules. Let me ask you a question. Do you think we have any man-made rules in our churches today? I see that smile, Andrew. What are some of the man-made rules we have? Got to lift your hands for worship? Or a different instrument. Or a different instrument. And you got to have certain instruments up on stage? Good. What else? Pass the basket. Pass the basket. Got to always have an offering? Good. Let's get some real dicey ones, people. Come on, let's see the police. Communion, first Sunday every month? Absolutely. That's somewhere in the scriptures. Second hesitations, I think. <laughs> what else? Children have their own service? Good. What else? Pray before you eat. Yeah. How about no smoking, no drinking? Okay. What? <laughs> sure. I mean, you know, you drink, oh, you know, forget it. You smoke, oh, but, you know, take a big plate of food and howl it all down and be a glutton, no problem. So we've got all of these rules that are man-made in the church that a lot of times we, we just, you know, kind of abide with, don't say much, when we, in many ways, hey, if this is going against what can reach out to Gentiles, to people of other nationalities, Muslims, break the rules. Break the rules. I was at a church in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, in Peachtree City. And I found out that the uh, church right down the road had an apartment complex with 72 different languages spoken in the apartment complex. It was a huge complex. 72 different languages. And the only time they were all there was on Sunday morning. And so I said to the, to the missions pastor, I was trying to get very practical, I said, can I talk about this and get these people involved? And his answer was, no. Why? Well, because if the people go, then they won't be attending church and our numbers will go down. I just died inside. Their unwritten rule was they've got to have high numbers to stay up in their denominational rankings. Rules that we have, Jesus broke them if it concerned reaching Gentiles. Also broke them for other means. So he goes and says, I will go and heal him. The centurion replies, look, I don't deserve to have you do this. Just say the word, my servant will be healed, for I myself am an authority, from the soldiers on me. I tell this one, go and he goes, that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he doesn't. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, hmm, not bad for a Gentile. Is that what the text says? No. no. What's it say? I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I have not found it. Who was following Jesus at that time in the context as well as in the other places? There were religious leaders. So he turns to these religious leaders, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the leaders of religion, and basically says to those leaders, this Gentile that you call a dog has got more faith than any of you. Do you realize what that means? It means that Hindu down at the local 7-Eleven store might not only come to know the Lord, he might have more faith and be the next Billy Graham for his people and outdo everybody in your church. You ever thought of that? The local Muslim, the local Buddhist, the local whatever person from other nations, you could reach out to them and they could be a world changer. They can have more faith than anybody in your churches. 
man, doesn't that excite me? Lord, lead me to people like this soldier. Lead me to people of great faith. He continues. After inflicting a wound in the souls of the religious leaders, he begins to rub salt in it. He says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Okay, let's break this down. Many will come from the east and the west. And Luke, in a parallel passage, talks about the north and the south. What's north and south and east and west of Jerusalem? The whole world. That's another way of saying all nations. So Jesus is saying there will be people coming from all nations. And they will take their place at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, did you ever wonder why God comes on the scene and says, Hi, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Did you ever wonder that? Did you ever study their lives? Hi, I'm the God of Abraham. Well, yes, he was the founding father of our faith, but he was also a flagrant liar. Uh, she's my sister. I did a Bible study for our teenage children, uh, two of our two oldest ones, Luke and Elise. And we studied that passage, my daughter, and he says, I never want to marry a scumbag like Abraham. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm the God of Isaac. 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 Yeah, there's a couple paragraphs on Isaac. Not that much. And he lies like his father. Hi, I'm the God of Jacob, also known as the deceiver. Oh, I get it. You're a guy with a bunch of liars. Is that what he's trying to say? Well, in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. Why does he say I'm the God of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, if you do not know, those are the only three men that God made a commitment to, to what? Bless. To bless all nations. nations. He repeated it three times to Abraham, once to Isaac, and once to Jacob. Those are the only men that God made a promise to that I'll bless you, and you're going to be a blessing to all nations. So what's he basically communicating? He's communicating, I'm a God, you want to know my business card? Here it is. I'm a God who's made a commitment to redeem people from every ethnic group on the face of the earth. I'm a God who's made a promise to reach people from every tongue, every tribe, and every nation. Now he is also the God of a bunch of liars, a bunch of sinners. Why is that? What's he communicating there? Well, I'd like to, to ask you what I call my elephant in the room question. Okay, my elephant in the room question. Let me tell you what the elephant in the room question is. Uh, how many of you have ever heard, this is the question that leads up to it, how many of you have ever heard of Muslims coming to know Christ through dreams? But the majority of us. Okay, here's the elephant in the room question none of us ever want to ask. Ready? Why doesn't he reach all of them that way? Is that not a legitimate question, yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. And the answer is? He gets more glory by using people like you and me than he does if he did it by himself. And this is all about the revelation of his greatest glory. So God said, I want, I made a commitment to use people to reach people. When a young couple goes and gets training, raises up financial support, raises up prayer laborers, goes to a tribal group in the middle of Brazil, where we're going to Brazil, and tries to trust God to learn their language, to develop relationships, to share the gospel, to see the tribal group come to know the Lord, to see a church planted, God gets far more glory doing it that way than if He just spoke to them in dreams. That's just... I can do it myself. I have no problem. I'm the Almighty God. That's not a problem. But this isn't so much about reaching the lost as much as it is about revealing my glory. And I'm going to get more glory by using you. So yes, I'm a God of a bunch of sinners, a bunch of liars. Why? I get more glory taking a liar, transforming their life and their soul, changing their whole heart motivation so that they prize me as their precious treasure and they go and sacrifice their lives.
This is why we do world missions. To reveal our Father's greatest glory. And the process is just as important as the end goal. The process of loving your spouse, loving your kids, in the context of reaching an unreached people group, is just as valuable to God as reaching the lost. Because it's all about His glory. Now, in the text, there is a feast. They were brought to the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What's the difference between a feast and a meal? A meal is something you eat very quickly, do the dishes, you don't have A feast is a time of celebrating. It can last up to a week, sometimes even two weeks in length. So up in heaven, right now, is a feast. Or there's going to be, excuse me, there's going to be a feast, a celebration. What are they going to be celebrating at this feast? God's glory and the fulfillment of His greatest glory. God using people to reach people in fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Notice that's why it says in the text, they will take, what's it say? Their places. It does not say they will crash the party. <laughs> if they crash the party, what's it communicate? They weren't really invited. If they take their places, what does it mean? They already have what? Reservations. They already have reservations. The tribal group that he is going to, God already has reservations for people from that tribe for him to reach. Oh, how encouraging that is for missionaries to be going out and to say this is not an exercise in futility. This is not something we're just hoping and praying God might move. No, there are reservations already made. Our goal is to find the people that God has res reservations for. Huge difference than just going out blindly and just saying, oh God, please do something. Going to the Scriptures. There will be one day when you and I are at a party and at the party we'll be at the head of the table, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we will be celebrating the glory of God shining in its greatest way by God using people like you and me to turn around and to reach people from other nations and other ethnic groups to reveal His greatest glory. Well, my time is almost up. Very quickly, let me, uh, we'll go on with the notes after the break. If you are at all interested, every speaker is different, uh, but I do bring books. Uh, everything I'm telling you is in this book right here, God's Bottom Line. Uh, this is fresh off the press. It's about two weeks old right now. Uh, everything I'm teaching you is in here and much, much more in this book. I also go over blindness, why God blinds the eyes of the church to the Great Commission, and why He blinds the eyes of Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus to the Gospel, and why He does all of that out of love. And also, how a loving God of the New Testament could order the death and destruction of so many people in the Old Testament. He's the same God. How could He do that? All of that is found in this book. For those of you who don't believe anything unless you watch it on television, it's in DVD form. <laughs> Eight lessons for small groups, Sunday schools. If you want to teach what I'm teaching, it's right here in this You Teach CD. It's four PowerPoint lessons designed for you to teach it. I tell you what to say on every slide. There's an audio example of it, and it's all right there. I'm probably best known for cat and dog theology. Cat and dog theology is a very simple joke about the difference between a cat and a dog. A dog says, you pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me. You must be God. A cat says the exact same thing. You pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me. I must be God. <laughs> that joke characterizes Christians around the world that there are many Christians who basically think God lives for us. As a result, we only focus on the top line. This gets the foundational part. Also with this cartoon book, 101 Differences Between Cats and Dogs, 101 Cartoons Designed One for Every Potty in Your House. <laughs> Cat and Dog Prayer. The average Christian today prays three minutes a day. The average pastor prays five minutes a day. Why so little prayer? I challenge you in this book, very early on in their Christian life, they prayed very caddish prayers, very selfish prayers. James 4.2, God says, I don't answer selfish prayers. Prayers weren't answered, so they concluded, eh, I guess prayer doesn't work. So I'll just check in with God for three minutes a day just to make sure he knows I'm here. 
This teaches you how to pray God, uh, God kingdom prayers. Prayers for His kingdom, not your kingdom. If any of you homeschool, we have all of the stuff in homeschool curriculum format. You can see me about that. Cat and dog, look at the cross. I started tonight saying the primary purpose of Christ's death was not for our sins, but for the glory of the Father. This book goes over that in much depth. It shows you the freedom that there is in living for that. If you've got the vision of reaching the nations, how do you deal with it? Should you be a goer, a sender, a mobilizer, work with internationals? What are the main options? I walk you through that with this book. Emma's story, a true story of a four-year-old little girl who had an entire building fall on her in the 1999 earthquake in Turkey. Uh, an American dog sniffed her out. She was on the U.S. News uh, back in 99. And um, they sent her to a mentally handicapped institute to die. She was so traumatized. My friends ended up adopting her. A true story written from the glory of God perspective, written by a 16-year-old homeschool girl with me. The best book for children and grandchildren, I heard good news today, 93 short two-minute stories giving kids a vision for the glory of God and going to the nations. It talks about how it geographically began in Jerusalem and spread out to the very ends of the earth, eventually ending in the Americas, the last continents to be discovered. So, who is going to tell us about the break? Go ahead. <laughs> cool, so we're going to take a break. Uh, there was something I forgot to mention... Uh, at the beginning that I did want to talk about.